Greek Orthodox Telecommunications presents Holy Image, Holy Space, Icons and Frescoes from Greece. Part one of a two-part series, Windows to Heaven. From the timelessness and beauty of our Orthodox religious heritage comes an exhibition of profound significance. Over 80 devotional treasures of Christian, Byzantine and post-Byzantine culture, most of them never before displayed in the United States, are assembled in this ambitious exhibit, which recently began its two-year tour of America at the Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore, Maryland. Closely related to the popular and highly acclaimed From Byzantium to El Greco exhibition mounted at the Royal Academy in London in 1987, Holy Image, Holy Space came to fruition through the combined efforts of the Byzantine Museum of Athens, the Greek Ministry of Culture, the Trust for Museum Exhibitions in Washington, D.C., and the Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore. The icons and frescoes compiled in Holy Image, Holy Space date from the 10th to the 17th centuries and come from every area of Greece. They are the legacy of Byzantium, which at one time encompassed most of the Mediterranean world as well as parts of Europe. During its thousand-year history, the Byzantine Empire adopted the Greek language and Greek education while remaining socially and politically linked to the later Roman Empire. With Byzantium's capital at Constantinople, the meeting point between East and West, the evolution of a new religion was fostered, Christianity. The exhibition's curator in the United States and one of the prime movers behind this initiative is Dr. Gary Vikan, a leading Byzantinologist and assistant director for curatorial affairs and curator of medieval art at the Walters Art Gallery. Greece, more than any other modern nation uh, that was formerly in the Byzantine Empire, has vast numbers of fine icons and frescoes. And over and beyond that, they have, they've taken the care to preserve, and in the case of the frescoes, to remove some of them from the walls. So it was an ideal situation for us. Here was what we needed and the will to bring it to us. We're very pleased with that. Over the centuries, the deeply spiritual Byzantines forged the synthesis of Christianity and Hellenism producing the unique traditions, values, and ideals which expressed and revealed the Orthodox faith. The icon emerged from the very embodiment of Byzantium's most profound spirituality and most sublime creativity. Icon in Greek means image, but of course an icon isn't every image. Uh, usually we think of an icon as a painted panel with a gold background and an abstract portrait of, a, of Christ or the Virgin Mary or a saint. But icons can be great mosaics, they can be tiny coins, and in the late seventh century, the Byzantine gold coin had an icon of Christ on the front. An icon could be over the gate of a city, it could be around your neck, it could be on the bezel of your ring. So it could be almost anything. In fact, I, I posed the question for myself, could a cloud be an icon? And in fact, I think a cloud could be an icon, and, and as evidence for that, there's a, a story in the 15th century, shortly before the fall of the Byzantine Empire, that. There was a spot in the church of Hagia Sophia where somehow the marble seemed to suggest a portrait of a face. And Christians were venerating this spot on the wall of just spontaneously appearing marble, in other words, the veins in the marble, because they thought this was an icon. Now the fact of the matter is what this all boils down to is that the icon is defined in here. It doesn't reside in any special quality or technique or size or format or anything else. An icon is what people believe it to be. It's a sacred image. It's a way of uh, contacting the divine. It's a, it's a channel or a window or a door to heaven. And once people have this belief in the sanctity of the image, then they will treat the image in special ways. So often times we can define an icon by what people do to or with or for it. An icon is something to burn candles in front of, to burn incense with. An icon is something to sing to, to venerate. This is how we know what an icon is. The exhibit at the Walters has helped us focus even more directly on what is an icon. An icon is a religious image. 
It can be of an individual, it can be of a scene. It brings to us in a very living kind of way an experience that comes to us either from Old Testament times or from New Testament times and from the life of the church throughout the ages. When you look at an icon, it is, as we have been told, a window to heaven. But it's also more than that. It's a window from which heaven can look at us. And when we stand before an icon, there is a mystical kind of experience that the worshiper has because he is able through that image, that religious image, either on paper or on wood or on oil, however it's presented to us, to have a kind of special union with the divine. So when I think of an icon, I think of the icons that stand before us in churches, I think the icons that are in the walls of our homes, where we can pause and stand and reflect upon the meaning of life and ultimately the meaning of life everlasting, where we will become a kind of an icon ourselves. The accepted orthodox view of what an icon is was succinctly stated nearly 12 centuries ago by Saint Theodore the Studite. Every artificial image exhibits in itself, by way of imitation, the form of its model. The model is in the image, the one in the other, except for the difference of substance. Hence, he who reveres an image surely reveres the person whom the image shows, not the substance of the image. Nor does the singleness of his veneration separate the model from the image, since by virtue of imitation, the image and the model are one. One of the reasons that I perceive uh, the iconography to have come into a, the development of the church in a rather late period was because the church was struggling early on with other issues. The, the whole issue of how ecumenical councils came into being and the issues that had to be resolved were overwhelming for the early church. I think that in, as we look back from today's time, we can't realize how difficult it was. The church needed to define, the church needed to expand, the church needed to teach. And there were other issues that were far more important than religious art to the Christians. They had to define the natures of Christ. They had to divine, define the position of the Theotokos in the life of the church. They had to talk about the wills of God and the natures and all, all these things which were so demanding upon the theological mind of the time. And then, perhaps at about the sixth or seventh century, a peace began to come upon the church. The issues were resolved. The ecumenical councils really had brought to the people a kind of definition of the faith. And once this peace came upon the church, then the church could look to find ways to enhance the beauty that they wanted to put into their churches. And I think at this time, images began to come about. Holy image, holy space has as its two goals the following. First, to present Byzantine art as good art. And that is a twofold process in and of itself. We want people to be aware of how fine Byzantine painting can be and secondarily how important Byzantine painting is and was for the creation of Western painting, the more familiar kind of religious painting that people encounter in museums in America. But over and beyond that, and in fact almost more important than that, I want people to sense Byzantine art and specifically the icon for its spiritual power. And that's why the exhibition is very intimate and fairly dark and I think quite spiritual because we want people to experience the Byzantine painting panel much as if they were in a Byzantine church of the 12th or 13th century. And if they can do that, they'll take a memory that's more than intellectual with them. They'll take a spiritual memory and that will never leave them. Uh, ordinarily, an art exhibit does not begin with a, with a large object that somehow reaches out into the lobby. We wanted to use this very impressive image of Christ uh, Pantocrator, in order that people understand that this is not a normal art exhibit. Uh, they have to realize that these are objects which otherwise would be in churches and monasteries, and when they approach them, they should approach them with a sense of reverence. And in order to enforce that point in a very direct and powerful way, we took the, 
the largest image of Christ that survives on a painted panel from the Byzantine period here at my left, and put it at the very beginning of the exhibition. So, in effect, it reaches out into the lobby, and people enter from the street, and almost at the moment they begin to consider entering the exhibition, they are confronted by this figure. And I want them to feel intimidated almost, to feel very reverential, to feel quiet, and to realize that these are are great pieces of spirituality, even before and beyond the fact that they're fine works of art. And that they enter this space, they're entering a sacred space, and that they should act reverentially toward these, toward these paintings. This is the figure of Christ Pantocrator, in Greek, the all-powerful. And it's the most, uh, I suppose, characteristic image of Christ, whether in the dome of a church or on a panel painting as here, or even on a medallion or a cross that one might wear around one's neck. Christ confronts the viewer, and the point is to make eye contact. This, after all, is the heart of an icon. An icon is a kind of a, of a window or doorway between the world that we inhabit and the world of heaven. And in order to meet uh, the sanctity of heaven, Christ, the Virgin Mary, and the saints, one has to meet them through the eyes. And so eyes are very important. It's not as if Christ is looking directly at you, but in a general way toward you. And he can accommodate almost any emotion or any spirituality you bring to, toward him. And he communicates to you not only through his eyes, but through his gesture, a very prominent gesture of blessing and speech with his right hand, and the open book in his left hand. So in effect, there's a dialogue that goes on. And in order that that dialogue not be contaminated by the transient qualities of life, by time and space and weather and place and things like this, the background of the icon is, is, a, is a sheet of gold. Everything else, everything that's temporal, everything that's locational, is eliminated. And the point, of course, always is to have that direct contact. It's a sacred portrait, but a portrait for communication. The title of this exhibition is Holy Image, Holy Space, and it's that second concept of holy space that we try to convey in this, the first real room of the, of the exhibition. And we do this through a series of frescoes that all come from a church in West Central Greece. They date from the early 13th century. And I'm standing next to really the finest of them right here, Saints Cosmas and Damien, the two doctor saints of the early Byzantine period. And we, we asked for and generously were given these frescoes by the Greek Ministry of Culture for the exhibition because they help tell a very important story. First of all, that icons are not confined to wooden panels. I think people who have a, a kind of a passing knowledge of icons think of them always as very abstract portraits of holy figures on wooden panels with gold backgrounds. But icons can as well be in the form of mosaics and frescoes. And when they are in the form of frescoes, as they are here in this room, they do something that an icon on a panel really cannot do, and that is they create sacred space. They cover the inside walls of a Byzantine church and they communicate with one another. They do that sort of in two ways. First of all, uh, if they're telling a story, for example, the Annunciation, with Gabriel bringing the news of the birth of the Christ child to the Virgin Mary, Gabriel may be on one wall and the Virgin Mary on the other. And they communicate across open space. And then quite literally, that space between them becomes sanctified. But there's yet another dimension to the idea of holy space, and that is that the interior of, of a Byzantine church is, is seen by orthodoxy the medieval period and even today, as a kind of recreation of the entire Christian cosmos. And it's done in a very strict, hierarchical fashion. So that God the Father is in heaven in the dome of the church in his pantocrator pose. Then over the altar will be the Virgin Mary. And then gradually as one works one's way toward the ground and from east to west away from the altar, the figures descend in hierarchy from the apostles to the church fathers to the military saints to the martyrs to the female martyrs and finally you're at the west entrance on ground level and progressively these figures become smaller and as i said relatively less important within the church hierarchy and then as one enters this space as a christian you yourself find your own position you enter the, the hierarchy granted on the lowest level but still you're there you're not just looking at the Christian cosmos, you've entered it and you've become part of it. A second thing we want to convey with these frescoes beyond the idea of holy space is the wonderful creativity and, and ingenuity of the, of the Greek conservators who were able to remove these 
these wonderful wall paintings from the walls of the church through a technique that's very painstaking, very difficult and very sophisticated, they took the frescoes off the wall. So I say these frescoes date from the 13th century. But well, once they'd removed this layer of frescoes, they found underneath it another layer about 200 years earlier. And on the opposite wall in this room, where I'm looking right now, are the two layers, essentially one beside the other. On the left, a standing uh, martyr saint with a martyr's cross in his hand, and on my right, Saint Elijah from the earlier level. And it's wonderful to see them side by side because it's very clear how style can change over time. And the Byzantine art was not static at all. I think that uh, the people don't appreciate how dynamic it was. The earlier figure is almost doll-like in his abstraction, whereas the later one is very dynamic and, uh, and very powerful and very subtle in the way the painting is done. So this then, in aggregate, is what, what the exhibition is about. Sacred image, the first fig figure of Christ, and sacred space in these frescoes. We're now in the third room in the exhibition, and it's a chance for holy space and holy image to come together. Uh, I just spoke to you about the idea that somehow uh, icons, when they're on the walls of a church, interact with one another and create sacred space. Here in a small chapel that's been transported and rebuilt right, on the, right in our own galleries, uh, we have a chance to see how that sacred space, when it's very strictly organized, can be in service of the celebration of the Mass itself, the Divine Liturgy in the Orthodox Church. What I'm standing in front of right here is the inside of a small chapel from the Peloponnese in Greece, which was removed by a, by a group of conservation specialists 10 years ago, and comes to Baltimore and to the United States in 17 pieces with two people, a husband and wife, and they're the only two people in the world who can take this church apart and put it back together again. It takes them five days to put it together, three days to take it apart. They put it together, they, they take plaster to cover the seams and so on, and eventually they're covered up so that it looks as if we have a total interior of a Byzantine church, which in fact is what we have. It's a very small church. Nevertheless, all the pieces are there. So we understand, as I said before, how icons can come together to make a working environment for the celebration of the Divine Liturgy. Now, the most important thing about a Byzantine church, I guess, after the altar area itself, and the first thing that strikes somebody who's not Orthodox when they enter a church, whether it's medieval or modern, is what's called the iconostasis. And this is a screen of images, in this case made of plaster, which separates the altar area at the east end of the church from the area of the laity at the west. And it has a small door at the center, and that's called the royal door, because only priests and royalty can go through it. And always at the right of that door is the image of Christ, the all-powerful Pantocrator, and always at the left will be the image of his mother, the Virgin Mary, and Christ child. And the idea is, of course, that the hierarchy and strict order that you otherwise see in the dome and over the apse of the church in the large frescoes here comes down onto the iconostasis. Now the point of the iconostasis is to separate the laity from the mass and to keep the mysteries of the liturgy very mysterious and very quiet. Now as you look through the iconostasis, I hope you can see this, the altar is, is a, just a, a, a semicircular table built into the back wall. Just above it is what looks like a, a little slit. Well, this was the east window of the church. And above that and to each side are two church fathers. These are the church fathers, John Chrysostom and St. Basil, who are credited with writing the liturgies, and each holds a very large scroll, and on that scroll is the words that the priest himself will say. Then finally above, in the small apse above the altar area, is the Virgin Platitera. This is the most common pose of the Virgin Mary for the apse of a church, and it shows the Christ child literally superimposed as a deity, both man and God, over the passive body of his mother, and so graphically that way evokes the incarnation. To the left of the semicircular small altar area is what's called the Prothesis Chapel. This is where the bread and wine are prepared for the communion. And because, of course, the preparation and administration of the bread and wine is the reenactment of the Passion of Christ, the scene that you see there is the dead body of Christ with the wounds of the Passion and the implements of the wounds of the Passion. So this is a wonderful, wonderful way and a very special part of this exhibition for evoking the idea of sacred space. And I hope that when the visitor enters this area of the exhibition, they see frescoes coming together 
in the form of icons to make a functioning church that they realize how vibrant and vital the icon can be. And as they proceed to see uh, icons that have come off various icon screens from churches, they in their minds will somehow put this all together and make sense out of it. Now in Baltimore, as we stand at this spot, we're facing toward the apse area, southwest. But once this little chapel is put here, that is east, because in every Orthodox church, the altar area faces east, toward the spot where Christ will rise in his second coming. Now if that is east, necessarily the area over there is toward the west. And in an Orthodox church, whether it's in Baltimore in 1988 or in Constantinople in the 9th or 10th or 11th century, the west end of the church is the area of death. It's the area where the monks are laid out after they die and there, the funeral service takes place. So that all the decoration that exists in the west end of the church tends to revolve around the idea of death, judgment, and resurrection. We're now standing in what is, in essence, the western end or the death end of our reconstructed sacred space. And what we see here is the most common image, the most appropriate image in Byzantium for the evocation of death. And I'm not talking about the crucifixion because people don't die in orthodoxy in the way Christ died. They died in the way his mother died or seemed to die. Uh, so they usually show this scene, which is called the chemesis or Dormition of the Virgin Mary. Often it will be in the form of a fresco or mosaic. In this case, we have a very handsome Byzantine panel painting. Now you see here the Virgin Mary lies on her deathbed. It's bright red, she's dressed in blue, and gathered around are the 12 apostles. They've been out evangelizing all over the world, and as she approached death, uh, angels transported them miraculously back so they could be at her side at the moment of death. So they're mourning, they're very, very sad, and the poses of sorrow on their faces are just profound, very pathetic. Uh, they're just contorted, their eyebrows are going up and their cheeks are contorted and so on. So you really sense a, a, a real profound sense of sadness. At the same time, there's a, there's a stark contrast in spirit between that and the figure of Christ and the three Byzantine church fathers that appear just behind the bed. The reason for that is that the apostles form a kind of historical setting, whereas Christ and the three church fathers are part of the spiritual setting. They've appeared in order that Christ can take the soul of the Virgin Mary, his mother, in the form of a tiny baby that's wrapped in swaddling cloth, take the soul which he receives from his mother and pass it to an angel that's coming down from heaven to receive it and to take it up to heaven. Now what the apostles don't know is that the reason that the church fathers and Christ are not sad is that the Virgin Mary never in fact died. She fell asleep in Christ. And three days later, when the apostles will return to the tomb, they'll find that the body isn't there, so that their sorrow was, in a way, misplaced. It's a wonderful contrast between two quite different spirits and two quite different levels of reality, the spiritual level and the real-world level of sadness and sorrow. And you can imagine that every Christian Orthodox person who enters a church and sees this scene has a sense of empathy, a feeling of uh, a kind of sympathy for death and their remembrance of somebody who's died in the past and their confidence that much like the Virgin Mary, that deceased relative will someday be in heaven. Now we're at a different theme, a different iconic theme, and that's the one that's most characteristic of the Virgin Mary and child, and it's called the Hodikitria, she who shows the way. And it's called that because literally the Virgin Mary holds Christ on her left arm and she gestures toward him with her right hand, indicating to us, the viewer, that he is the way to salvation. Invariably, he will sit on the left arm, he will have his hand raised in a gesture of blessing, and he'll hold in his left hand a tiny scroll indicative of the Gospels. And the point of the icon, of course, is to make visual contact with the Virgin. The Virgin looks at you and she says, in essence, don't look at me, look at the Christ child, he's the way to salvation. You look at the Christ child and he blesses you. He looks unusually old, and I think this surprises people who aren't orthodox. He looks quite old because, by orthodox belief, he understood his divinity and his mission from a very young age. Now, there's something about this icon that is important besides the fact that it's the first in the exhibition that really shows the most characteristic pose of the Virgin and Child. Now we see an icon that has fittings at the bottom in order that it can be carried on a large stick in processions. But there's a quality about this icon that's almost unique and really quite disturbing. What I'm talking about is the area of the eyes of the Virgin. 
She's looking but not quite at us, and she's not at all peaceful. She's very concerned, she's very anxious, she's very sad. Certainly, she's under a great deal of stress. And at first view, it's not obvious why. The question is, why is she nervous? And now we understand why. We understand why the Virgin is very concerned. As we move around to the back of this panel and realize it's not simply a processional icon. It's a processional icon with two sides painted. On the front side is the Virgin and Child in the Hodogitria pose. On the back side is the first portrait surviving anywhere in the history of art, the dead Christ. He's not on the cross. He's not in front of the cross. He's not being put in the tomb. He's just there and dead. His arms are down at his side, his head is forced down into his neck, his eyes are closed, and there's one touch of red on his upper lip. The man of sorrows, as the Greeks call him, and what he does is to complete the mission of the child on the other side. The two sides of this icon must be understood together. So the Christ on the other side is old, he understands what's about to happen. The Virgin is concerned because she knows as a mother that her son will die. The significance of Holy Image, Holy Space, I think, lies in the fact that here is the first opportunity for an American audience to see fine Byzantine panel painting, and a lot of it. And my hope, and I think my conviction already is, that five years from now, seven, ten, twelve years from now, there will be many, many people, and I'm not speaking solely about the Orthodox community in America, many, many people who will say, yes, Byzantium, icon painting, fine art. For the first time, they're aware of this phenomenon, of this medium, and of the level that Byzantium reached in painting. Next week, Greek Orthodox Telecommunications presents part two of Holy Image, Holy Space, A Theology in Colors, which documents the role of Byzantine icons in the development of Western panel painting by evoking the artistic, historical, social, and religious context from which the icon emerged. The preceding program was brought to you in part by grants from the Acme, Sponge and Shami Company Incorporated, Amac Enterprises Incorporated, and the Century Broadcasting Corporation. This has been a Greek Orthodox Telecommunications Production.